Let's pray. Gracious God, thank you so much for your word, Lord. We thank you for the cross. We thank you for Jesus, Lord. Uh, I know it's February and we're looking at a passage that's usually preached around Christmas time, but God, praise you for that because now we don't have all the commercial garbage to distract us from what your word teaches us. Lord, I pray, Father, that you would be with us this morning and that if there's anything in our lives and our hearts that's hindering us from worshiping you with everything that we have, God, I pray that you would remove it by the power of your Holy Spirit, Lord. I pray, Father, that you would help us to focus upon your word and to be transformed by this life-giving truth that we're looking at this morning. We love you, Father, and we praise you. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. What's the best news you've ever heard? The best piece of news you've ever gotten? What is it? Maybe, maybe you got a phone call and you got it accepted into a school that, you, that you've been trying to get into. Or maybe it, was, uh, you know, maybe, maybe it was a phone call announcing the birth of a grandchild. You know, maybe that was it. Or maybe it was the moment your spouse said yes when you asked her to marry you. I know that was pretty, I know that was pretty good for me. That was, that, that was pretty good for me. You know, perhaps it was a, a phone call informing you that you got that job that you'd applied for that was going to change everything, that had all the benefits, the nice salary that was really going to set you and your family up for life. Maybe that was it. Now, I remember uh, just in December when, uh, right before Gabriel was born, we'd had so many false alarms and so many different things that just, you know, that freaked us out. I mean, I think I called my mom probably four different times telling her, well, I think it's actually going to happen now. You know, and so after Gabriel was born, I remember calling her and she just burst into tears and she goes, I thought it was never going to happen. You know, and she'll be, she'll be here in a couple of weeks. And my mom's just a tight person. I mean, she'll cry at the drop of a dime. You know, and I, I, I love her to death. You know, but, uh, but praise God for good news, right? Praise God for good news. I want you guys to look at me. Listen very closely. There is no better news in all of history that you have ever received in your life than the birth, the life, the death, and the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Amen. There is no better news than the birth, the life, the death, and the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Do you understand? Do you, under, do you understand? The problem is, is that just as I mentioned last week, the gospel of Jesus Christ has become common to the church. The gospel of Jesus Christ has become common to the church. That is a sad thing. That should break our heart. That should break our hearts. We live in a day and age where, what's, where we're told that what's most important is how you feel about yourself. You know, oh, you're awesome. Don't let anybody get you down. You know, maybe you just have self-esteem issues. You know, don't, don't listen to any of that. You're great. Well, that's partly true. The best part about any of us is that we're created in the image of God. That's the best part about any of us, is that God formed us and created us in his, in his image. That's the best part about us. Other than that, we are sinful. We are all rebellious against God in our own way. We all deserve the wrath of God, and Jesus came and paid the price so that we don't have to experience that if we place our faith in Him. Praise God for good news. That's better than the birth of a grandchild. That's better than your spouse saying yes. That's better than being accepted into the school that you've always wanted to go to. That's better than you getting a yes to your perfect job. That's better than getting a phone call saying, hey, good news, the cancer is in remission. Do you understand that? That is better news. That is better news that in Jesus Christ, you get to live with God in his presence forever. It's what we were created for. It's what he made us for. That is good news. That is the best news ever. And here's the thing. That doesn't change if the woman you want to marry says no. That doesn't change if you don't get the job that you want. That doesn't change if the cancer doesn't go into remission. That doesn't change if you don't get into the school that you want. None of that changes this good news. None of it. None of it. Today I want you to simply sit and just let this sink in. God loves you. Jesus loves you. It's not because of anything you've done. It is not because of anything you haven't done. Do you understand that there is nothing that you could have done that would change the fact that God loves you? There is nothing you could have done. I don't care what you did last night that maybe you hope nobody finds out about. I don't care what it was. I don't care what relationships you've blown. I don't care what you've done that you're ashamed of. I don't care what you've done that you're proud of. I don't care that you're a standing pillar in the community. I don't care that you make X amount of dollars and that you take care of your family well. None of it matters. God loves you anyway. 
Jesus loves you. God loves you. Let that sink in. Let that sink in. Why? Because he chose to. Because he's awesome. Not because we are. Because he's awesome. Today's our third series in, or third sermon in a series called uh, Rediscovering Jesus, a historical picture of the God man. We're going verse by verse, chapter by chapter through the book of Luke. It was written by a man named Luke. Go figure. Uh, this is known as the Gospel for Skeptics. Okay, Luke was a very educated man. He was a physician. He was also a historian. Uh, Luke was a man who was hired most likely by a very powerful, high-up Roman government official in first century, right after Jesus had, had been nailed to a cross and was resurrected. He was probably hired by this man because he had heard the gospel and realized that it didn't matter what it would cost him to follow Jesus if it was actually true. And so as he encountered the gospel message, he recognized that changing his life and following Jesus would probably cost him his life here on earth. It would probably cost him everything that he had going for him. And so he realized, he said, okay, he said, before I do this, he said, if this is, going, if this is real, Luke, I'm going to pay you to walk away from your career as a physician. I'm going to pay you to go out and actually interview these people. I want you to go out and talk to these people who are preaching. I want you to go out and talk to this woman, Mary, who says that she had a child when she was a virgin. I want you to go out and talk to this man, Zechariah, who, who claims to have had a vision in the temple from an angel of God. I want you to go out and talk to these people. And I want you to find out if what is actually being said is true. And here's the thing is that I want to tell you guys the exact same thing that he realized back then. If it's not true, what are we doing here? If it's not true, we're here for nothing. If it's true, it changes everything and it should absolutely be at the foundation of every decision we make. It should absolutely be at the foundation of everything we do. When it comes to the gospel and the things of God and the things of the kingdom, that should come absolutely first regardless of what it might cost us. If it's true, it changes absolutely everything. But if it's not, this is a shame and we should not be here this morning. It's not about moralism. It's not about living a good life and it doesn't really matter what you believe. If this is true, it changes everything. See, the Bible teaches us that uh, God created a perfect world where sin didn't exist. That he created it in six days, right? And on the seventh day he rested. It says that he created man and woman in his image and that they were alone were to have governance over the world under God's authority. They were given one thing not to do and they did it. They couldn't even have a kid first and they ended up doing it. They ended up rebelling against God. Sin, right? We tend to think of sin, well, if you, if, if you have a beer, that's a sin. If you cuss, that's a sin. If you smoke, that's a sin. No, 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 no. Sin is something that, it, it's a curse that fell upon all of creation. It absolutely tainted everything that we do, everything that exists. Sin is somehow involved. There's a quote, I don't remember who said it, but it was brilliant. It said, sin is what happens when the human heart is not satisfied with God. Boy, fill in the blank. That could be just about anything. That could be just about anything. Anything you do when your heart is not satisfied with God is sinful. It's sinful. All right, and so then in Genesis 3.15, we see the fall, right? Mankind, they, they, they sin, and all this thing, you know, and, and everything just basically falls to the wayside. And Throughout the rest of the Old Testament, throughout the rest of, of the history of the people of God, we start to see these prophecies that are going to come. Right after the fall, God promised that He wasn't going to finish, that He wasn't finished with man yet. He said, I'm going to send a, I'm going to send a human. I'm going to send somebody. It's going to be the seed of the woman. And he tells the serpent who had deceived mankind in the garden, he said, Don't worry, he said, there's going to come a day. He basically curses the serpent, says, Cursed are you above all other uh, above every other living thing. He said, But there's going to come a day when the seed of the woman is going to crush your head. You're going to be done. Okay, that is the, what, what uh, scholars call the proto evangelion It's the first preaching of the gospel is what that translates to. The first time God said, I'm going to send a Savior. I'm going to fix it. This, don't worry, this isn't the end. But you're going to have to live in brokenness. You're going to have to live in brokenness, right? And then uh, in this particular passage that we're looking at today, 
Right? This is called the Annunciation. Right? This angel comes and announces that this prophecy is finally taking place. And in this moment, what we see is the fulfillment of major, major, major prophecies that have taken place throughout the rest of the Old Testament. Right? So Genesis 3.15, you get the first preaching of the Gospel. He says, that I'm going to send a Savior. Isaiah 7.14, it's going to come from a virgin. There's going to be a virgin who's going to bear a child. Jeremiah 23, it's going to come from the line of David. Within the first few verses of this passage, what do we find? A virgin being told she's going to have a kid. Okay? A virgin that's going to be told she's going to have a kid. This fulfills the one in Genesis 3.15, and it also fulfills the one in Isaiah 7.14. Oh, she was from the line of David. Boom, there's another one. The nativity story, just from a literary standpoint, is one of the most beautiful stories ever told. Do you understand? The most, and here's the most beautiful part about this story, is that you can take all of the classic works of fiction, you can take the Iliad, you can take the Odyssey, you can take, Shake, you can take anything that Shakespeare's ever written, and none of it even compares just from a literary standpoint. But here's the thing, is that the best part about this story is that it's true. Is that it's true, it actually happened. And so as we, as we get into this story, we find out that God is a God who is for the underdog. God likes the underdog. He blesses the underdogs. All right, listen to this. You know, so as you're sitting here and you start to think, why, why in the world did God go for Mary instead of somebody else? Why in the world did God go to a town called Nazareth that, by the way, there was no pre-Christian mention of Nazareth in any historical writings outside of the Bible? Uh, that, that were actually found until 1962. Okay, Nazareth was literally just like this tiny, dingy little town that was known for uh, corrupt politics. Roman, uh, Roman soldiers infested this tiny little town and poor, poor Jewish people. That's it. That's all, that's all, that, that's all that, was, that this town was known for. Okay, why did God pass up Jerusalem where he could have announced this to the high priest in Jerusalem where, I mean, you talk about wanting to get good news out to the world. Why, why did he start in Nazareth? Why did he start there? Why didn't he start at the, with the big one? Why didn't he start there and just like let it go from there? Really, I mean, think about what, think about what the Bible says about Nazareth. In John 1, in John 1 46, uh, Nathaniel, he goes, Nazareth. He said, can anything good come from there? This is right after they had just said, hey, we found the Messiah. And he was born in Nazareth. And Nathaniel goes, Nazareth? What in the world good ever has come from Nazareth? That's, that's Nazareth. All right, so now let's talk about Mary. Who is Mary? Okay, who is Mary? Mary, she, I mean, she's nothing special. I mean, she's, I mean she is special because when you look at it, there is probably no, there's no woman on this earth who was blessed and who had more favor from God than Mary, the mother of Jesus. Okay, you get people who worship Mary. That's not it. You know, we, we tend to, as Baptists and as Protestants, we tend to undervalue Mary. We'll get, we'll get there in a second. But, uh, but really, like, so what, what do we know about Mary? We know that she was, uh, that at that point in time, she was from Nazareth. She was poor. She was probably between the ages of 12 and 14 years old. Okay, uh, chances are she was not educated. She probably couldn't read, so that makes her illiterate. Um, you know, her, what her life looked like at that point in time, like her plans were probably to, uh, well, obviously to marry Joseph because she was betrothed to Joseph, right? That was her plan. She was going to live a very poor life, a humble life in this little town called Nazareth where probably women and, women and men from this town in that place never were going to be able to travel more than a couple miles outside of their hometown. Okay, that was going to be the life for Mary. And she was probably going to have several poor children that didn't have a future that was really any better than hers. That's what Mary's life looked like up until this point. That was her plan. That's what she had expected. That was what she kind of went, went on. That's what she was ready for. So here we have a peasant girl in a no-name town, about 12 years old, illiterate, in her scripture knowledge, her knowledge of God. I mean, she was a faithful Jew, obviously, because of what we find out in this text. But her knowledge of God would have been really limited to what she's heard in, tem- to what she's heard in the temple, or what she's heard in the synagogue, and what she has somehow memorized, being taught as a child. So as far as her having access to a Bible or being able to really interpret anything, she didn't know. She didn't know. Listen to this. From all indicators, her life would not be extraordinary, one commentator writes. He says, she would marry humbly, give birth to numerous poor children, never travel farther than a few miles from her home, one day uh, die like thousands of others before her, a nobody in a nothing town in the middle of nowhere. But listen to this. We cannot miss this because the greatest news that was ever proclaimed in Israel came to the humblest of people. Listen to what she says in Luke 1, 46 and 48. We'll look at this closer in, in, in a week or in, next week. 
Uh, but she says, My soul magnifies the Lord and my spirit rejoices in God my Savior, for he has looked on the humble estate of his servant. Right, so here's the thing is that when we look at this announcement, this announcement of the Messiah coming into the world to save mankind from their sin, listen to this, we have to accept this essential spiritual fact about the gospel. The Lord comes to and he blesses the needy people. The Lord comes to and he blesses those who realize that without him they cannot make it. Those who acknowledge their weakness and their spiritual lack. People who recognize that outside of God you've got nothing. That's who the Lord is for. The incarnation, the salvation, the resurrection, right, what we all celebrate at Christmas, these are not for the proud and self-sufficient. We live in a very proud and self-sufficient culture, don't we? I want to ask you something. Where would you be without God? How do you feel about yourself without God? Do you feel like you can make it? Do you, is, is God something that you just kind of throw onto the side of your plate? Or is he the plate itself and everything else just kind of, is he the foundation that it sits on? Our passage today unfolds in three parts. And what we're going to be looking at is the, the faith of Mary and what, that looks, and what that means for us. Because when we look at what it means to be a disciple of Jesus Christ, and what does it look like to actually follow, to have a heart that wants to follow God, there's probably no better example in all of Scripture than what we see in Mary in her humility in this passage. Okay, so today we're going to be looking at this story. It unfolds in three parts. You have the approach of the angel Gabriel. You have Gabriel's announcement right, to Mary. And then you have Gabriel's explanation when Mary asks a question. Let's look at this. So we have to remember, the main, pass the main characters in this passage, we have Gabriel, and now we have Mary. Gabriel, the angel of God, is talking to Mary. Last week it was funny. I said that Gabriel was an archangel. And afterwards, Ron came up to me and he goes, Nick, he says, I don't think the Bible names Gabriel as an archangel. And I looked up, I was like, sure enough, he didn't. And I had to figure out, I was like, and I looked at my notes and I was like, oh, I didn't have it in there either. Where did it come from? I was like, oh, well. You know, and so then the Bible nerd in me started figuring it out. And actually, there's a lot of tradition of what we tend to believe about angels that comes from works that aren't even in the Bible. Like They just kind of come from tradition and word of mouth and common knowledge. I mean, people, you know, and, and so anyways, that's a, whole other, that's a whole other thing. But So here we have Gabriel, the angel Gabriel. He's named in Scripture, uh, he, he's named in scripture three times, right? And it's really when he appeared to Zechariah. And he appeared to Zechariah just six months before he's appearing to Mary now. And he appeared to, the, to uh, Daniel 500 years before. Now when you look at his interaction with Zechariah and you look at his interaction with Daniel, the accounts are pretty similar. Here he comes with this pretty powerful message. They question God. And the next thing you know, they can't speak. They fall down and they can't talk. Right? Zechariah's punishment was that he would not be able to speak the rest, uh, throughout the entire pregnancy until his son was born. Right? Gabriel, God's messenger... I'd imagine, I mean, if he were to appear to you, he'd probably be pretty intimidating. You know, in, in either way, Mary's probably standing out in a field by herself. Gabriel's in the, or Zechariah's in the temple by himself. All of a sudden, you turn around, you're by yourself, and then you, there's an angel talking to you. I mean, I don't know about you. That, that freaked me out. That freaked me out, right? And so we see that Zechariah got freaked out, and we see that Mary got, got a little bit freaked out here. But, uh, you know, so this angel, he probably didn't look like a regular guy. I mean, there was something about Gabriel that uh, when, when these people looked at him, they probably, they knew that he wasn't, Wait, he's not from the village. He's not one of the priests. See, there, there's something different about him. All right, listen to this. Hey, verse 26, uh, verses 26 through 28 from today's passage. It says, In the sixth month, the angel Gabriel was sent from God to a city of Galilee named Nazareth, to a virgin betrothed to a man whose name was Joseph of the house of David. And the virgin's name was Mary. And he came to her and said, Greetings, O favored one. The Lord is with you. That's not a normal, that's not a normal uh, greeting from just a regular guy. All right, so here we have Mary, common, uneducated, illiterate, uh, poor 12 to 14 year old girl standing face to face with an angel. I bet, she's, I bet it took everything that she possibly could to not fall over at this point in time. Okay? The one thing keeping her going right now is probably the greeting. Like the thing, so here's this thing, you're really freaked out and you're thinking that, okay, I'm about, I'm about to die. And instead of anything harsh, what the angel says to her is, greetings, favored one, the Lord is with you. Like, okay, maybe I'm not going to die. What, what, what's happening? Okay, tell, tell me more. Why am I favored and why in the world are you telling me that the Lord is with me? I live in a village with maybe 50 people other than the corrupt Roman guards that come through here. Um, I don't have any real significant plans for my life. I can't read and I'm 12 years old. You, the Lord's with me? Are you serious? How, how is the Lord with me? And he goes on, right? And so, so he goes on. 
And, I, and real quick, I want to talk about Mary for a second. Right? I want to get into this a little bit because when it comes to Mary, we tend to have a really low view of Mary. We don't really talk about Mary much other than around Christmas time. Catholics pray to Mary. Um, so there's this tension here, right? Because somewhere in between is what you end up with, with Mary. Uh, she's, you know, she's not named among the apostles. She's just, you know, to us, she's just like, oh, she's the mother of Jesus. You know, so we talk about her once a year, and that's really about it. Catholics, on the other hand, want to pray to her. Listen to this. So there's, there's this guy named Raymond Brown. He's actually a scholar. He's a dean of the Catholic New Studies. Uh, and listen to what he says about Mary. Now, the Vulgate is a Latin translation of the Bible. Okay, so, he, so he goes on, he says, he says, The Vulgate's faulty translation gave rise to the medieval idea that Mary had every gift, not only spiritual but secular, even above those given to angels, giving rise to the idea of Mary being a dispenser of grace, resulting in prayers being offered to her. This is a Catholic scholar, by the way. And he acknowledges their faulty translation. Right? And this is, this is important for us because there's always going to be those questions. Well, what's the deal with Mary? How come Catholics do this and we do that? Right, so listen to this. And he goes on. He says, This error is reached its ultimate extension in December 8th of 1854 when Pope Pius IX declared the doctrine of the Immaculate Conception, teaching that from the first moment of her conception, the Blessed Virgin Mary was, by the singular grace and privilege of Almighty God and in view of the merits of Jesus Christ, Savior of mankind, kept free from the stain of original sin. Mary wasn't sinless. Mary wasn't sinless. Right, you see this later on when Mary's actually offering you know, sacrifices you know, at the temple when her and Joseph are going and, and, uh, and participating in the sacrificial system. If you weren't a sinner, you didn't offer sacrifices. The whole purpose of the sacrificial system is to atone for sin. Mary was a sinner in, in the Bible. Right, and so, here we ha so now we have to figure out. So here, this picture is actually called Mary, the Queen of Heaven. It comes from a Catholic website. Okay? And Mary is supposed to be like this intermediary, right? They, they pray to Mary, and Mary talks to Jesus, and she gets grace from Jesus and dispenses it out upon those who, who pray enough, you know, to Mary. And that's kind of how that works. That's wrong. That's absolutely wrong. We can look at Mary, and we can say that she is a solid example of what the Christian faith should look like. When we say that we follow God, when we say that we serve God, we should look at Mary and say, I want to serve God like she did. I want to be a servant of God like she was. I want to have the humble heart that she had. You know, regardless of what it costs me, yes, here I am, I'm your servant. You know, I'll, I'll let it be to me as you've said. That should be our posture, but that's not the Mary of the Bible. The Mary of the Bible is a poor peasant girl, illiterate, 12 years old, who didn't have much of a future. Who really, from the worldly perspective, didn't end up with much of a life either. And we'll talk about that later. I think Mary herself would have been appalled at this idea. It is a horrible misunderstanding that leads thousands and thousands of Christians astray all the time. All right, so here, when we see this, when we see this idea, Gabriel, Gabriel in his, when, he, uh, when he confronts Mary, he really offers her two things. The first thing is this, is that she was a recipient of divine favor. God looked at her and said, you, Mary, I'm going to give you divine favor. All right, listen, Martin Luther, who at the time he was a Catholic, but this is before the Protestant Reformation, he writes this. He says, Oh Mary, you are blessed. You have a gracious God. You have a gracious God. No woman has ever lived on earth to whom God has shown such grace. You are the crown of them all. That's a biblical picture of Mary. That's a biblical picture of Mary. But to pray to Mary is not, is not right. Absolutely not right. Right. Rather than announce the greatest news of all in the temple of Jerusalem, the Lord sent his messenger to a despised country, a despised town, and a humble poor teenager. Right. And the second part of this is that he, said, he says, not only, not only have you received divine favor, he says, the Lord is with you. That's awesome. That's awesome. Isn't that good news? Like, can you, do you understand that? Like, the Lord is with you? Do you understand that as a, as a believer, you have the Holy Spirit of God living in you, so I can accurately look at any one of you and say, the Lord is with you. Whatever you're going through, the Lord is with you. All right, that's also why it hurts so bad when we sin and we do things that we shouldn't do because the Lord is with you. The Lord is with you. It makes you uncomfortable when you sin. You know, but I can look at each and every one of you and say that if you believe in Jesus Christ, the Lord is with you. Praise God. Gabriel states that Mary had special favor from God and his special presence. No wonder he told her to rejoice. Rejoice, O favored one. He said to her, rejoice. Oh, favored one, the Lord is with you. Listen to this in Mary's response. But she was greatly troubled at the saying, 
right? Not at the appearance of the angel. She was greatly troubled at the saying and tried to discern what sort of greeting this might be. The, the, the literal sense here where it says discern, it means that he, she was sitting there, despite everything else, how freaked out she must have been, that she's sitting there talking to an angel. He's, she's focusing on the message that he's speaking. He's sitting there and he goes, wait a second, you're telling me that I'm favored by God and that the Lord is with me. And she's rolling that around in her head. She's like, what? I'm favored by God and the Lord is with me? She kept pondering what it meant. Mary was able to look at this angel and not freak out and just focus on the message that God was delivering to her. How do we do with that? How do we do with that? How do we, how do, we do with focusing on the message that God gives us? Right, how, do we, how, do we do, do, how, how much do we ponder the sermons that, that you guys hear on Sunday? When you read the Word of God, how much do you ponder what you read? When you're impacted with significant spiritual truth, does it hit you and just go right out the other side of your head? And is it gone ten minutes later as we're scrolling through Facebook or as we turn on the ball game or as we're watching TV for the next three hours on a Sunday afternoon? Or, you know, uh, and we live in a day and age where it's hard for us to ponder anything. Because we have so much information coming at us, 90 miles an hour, it's not any easier for me. I mean, I'm not trying to beat anybody up. I'm just saying, do we ponder the truth that God says to us? Do, do we ponder these things? We should. We should. At the beginning of the year, I, I started doing this, uh, it's, it's, it's uh, pastoral coaching. And this guy, he was, you know, he's telling me, in, in time management, I'm not good at it. I'm not good at it. Like, if you put me in a really structured environment and tell me I'm going to be doing this at this time, this at this time, this at this time, like, I would have done great in the military. Okay, but now if you give me an office and, you know, 40 plus hours a week and a list of things to do, not so much. If I'm in charge of my own structure, I don't do so well. So coming into this, I was like, okay, I need to address that, you know, so I started reading some books, doing some different things to help structure myself, and I started doing this coaching with the guy. And one of the things that he told me, he said, you need... As a, he said, as a, as a pastor, he said, no, 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 not even as a pastor. As a Christian, you need to carve out time to sit with the Word of God and listen. You need to carve out time to meditate, to think on the Word of God. We make time for everything else. Here's, it, this isn't any easier for me than it is for you. It's not, and, here, and, and just because I'm a pastor doesn't mean that, oh, that's something that Pastor Nick needs to do. That's not something that I need to do. That's, no, 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 that's not it. That's not it. All of us are called to ponder the Word of God. All of us are called to meditate on God's Word. You know, uh, blessed is the man who meditates on the Word of God. To read it throughout the Psalms. This is again and again and again. We're called to meditate on the things of God. Maybe even allow ourselves to be very serious before God and to read it, devote ourselves to Him and to allow ourselves to be troubled before God at our own spiritual state. Right? But we don't like that because we're into the whole self-esteem thing, Right? We, you know, in a world that tells us how awesome we are and what really matters is how awesome we feel about ourselves. The idea of sitting before God, you know, sitting with God's word before God makes us uncomfortable. Silence sometimes in a world with nothing but noise and, and entertainment makes us uncomfortable. You know, I'm just as uncomfortable as anybody else, like on Sunday nights when we've been meeting to pray. And we enter a time where there's probably a good five to ten minutes of just silence. It's awkward. It's awkward. I feel like, wait a second, shouldn't this be programmed? Shouldn't somebody be saying something? I think it's time for a song. You know, shouldn't, you know, I mean, it's, it's awkward. L listen to this, though. Fifth century uh, St. James, not James who wrote, who, who wrote the book of James. He wrote this very short, short, short liturgy. It says, Let all mortal flesh keep silent, and with fear and trembling stand. Ponder nothing earthly-minded, for with blessing in his hand, Christ our God to earth descended, our full, our, our full homage to demand. It's a different time back then when he wrote that. I want to move on now. So look at Gabriel's announcement, right? We're going to be looking at verses 30 through 34. All right, so at this point in time, Gabriel hadn't really told Mary why he was there. He just told her all of a sudden, hey, you're blessed and the Lord is with you. All right, so now he's actually, you know, he sees the troubled look on Mary's face and, and, and listen to what he says to her in verse 30. He says, the angel says to her, said to her, do not be afraid, Mary, you have found favor with God. And behold, you will conceive in your womb and bear a son and you shall call his name Jesus. Now he reveals his mission. His mission was at that point in time to go and tell this, good, or tell, tell this girl that she was going to be the vessel through whom God would bring the Messiah into the world to save mankind from their sin. That's a big deal. That's a big deal. They had been waiting for that 
for a long time. For a long time. All right, so now he, he, reveal, he reveals his mission. So here's this peasant girl saying, wait a second. You just told me that the Lord is with me and that I'm favored by God. I don't look like I'm favored by God. I certainly don't feel like I'm favored by God most times. But now here you are telling me that I'm favored by God and that the Lord is with me. And then he drops a bomb on her. He says, you're going to bring the Messiah into the world. Right, so he reveals his mission. At this point in time, she probably didn't fully understand yet. I mean, Jesus at the time, the name Jesus means Savior, but it was a common name. It was a very common name. It'd be like calling somebody Mike nowadays. You know, Mike, nothing special about Mike. You know, and, so, and so he goes on. He says, he will be great and will be, and will be called the Son of the Most High. Talk about something to ponder at that point in time. Here you have God's messenger angel telling you you're blessed. God is with you. You have divine favor, and now you're going to bring the Messiah into the world. You're going to call his name Jesus. He's going to be called the Son of the Most High. Right, he goes on and he says, and, 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 the Lord will give, and the Lord will give to him the throne of his father David, and he will reign over the house of Jacob forever, and of his kingdom there will be no end. Now this is when it starts to sink in for Mary. Because the, this right here is, is, when, uh, is when all of a sudden, so we, we have this thing called the Davidic Covenant, right? And it's found in 2 Samuel uh, chapter 7, verses 8 through 16. Now the common understanding of this, right? Because when you look throughout history and you see the way that David rose and he fell, this concept that, that God would give him this kingdom, the kingship of Israel forever, traditional Jewish understanding in the times of the Old Testament is that this was talking about the Messiah, and so, this is, so now all of a sudden what he's saying is a loose interpretation of that passage from the Old Testament. And it's starting to sink into her because even her as an illiterate, uneducated peasant girl, she knows that that passage means the Messiah. And she's saying, wait a second, you mean me? Me? Couldn't you find somebody else? Isn't there somebody more suited for this task than me? I can't read. I can't read. Like, I, and besides that, I've got my plans. Like, I'm, I'm betrothed to Joseph. We're going to have more poor kids, and we're going to live here in Nazareth forever. Like, I, my life is set. I've got plans. She let that sink in for a minute, right? And then, he, and then she looks to him, and she has one question. One question. And Mary says to the angel, verse 34, he says, How will this be since I am a virgin? Literally, the, the, since I am a virgin, what that translates is, I've never had sex with a man before. How in the world am I going to become pregnant? That's what she's asking him. It wasn't a matter of, God, are you sure that this is what you, you know, uh, you know uh, God, this can't happen, you can't do this. Like, there's a difference between the question that Zechariah had and the question that Mary has here. Right? Because last week we talked about Zechariah and when he, had, when, when he told him that, or when Gabriel told him that he was going to you know, bring John the Baptist into the world through his wife, he looks at him and he goes, well, wait a second, she's old, she's barren, this can't happen. And he goes, no, you have the Bible. You have the scripture. You know I've done this before on multiple occasions. What are you talking about? You're trying to tell... God can't be God? You're done talking. You're going to be used for this purpose. You're done talking. You can't speak until what God has said is going to come to pass. Now, Zechariah can't talk. All he can do is write and, and do signs. That's it. Okay, now that's not what Mary did here. What Mary did here is she's sitting there never, never having had sex with a man. She says, how in the world are you... How am I going to get pregnant? I've never had sex with a man. You're telling me I'm going to bear a son. I've never had sex before. That's a legitimate question, right? I mean, it's not doubting God. It's not questioning God's goodness. It's, it's completely different, right? Zechariah doubted. She didn't. She simply just wanted to know how it was going to work. She just wanted to know how it was going to work. And here, I want you guys to know this, is that when it comes to this thing, when it comes to the Christian faith, when it comes to following Jesus, when it comes to the Bible, it's okay to have questions. It's okay to have questions. God doesn't want us to doubt him. God doesn't want us to question his goodness, but it's okay to have questions. It's okay to look at this thing and say, the virgin birth, are you serious? That doesn't happen. I know that's what makes it a miracle. If it happened all the time, if we could explain it, if, if, if we could go back and say, well, actually, you know, under certain circumstances, this can happen, we could look at it and say, oh, no, that's not very miraculous. You know, Jesus rising from the dead, well, you know, that, that's crazy. I know that's what makes it a miracle. I know that's what makes it cool, right? That's what makes God God is that he can do things that don't happen. He's the one who put the laws into place. He can make those things happen. Here's the thing is that as we have questions, it's important to examine our hearts and, our, and, and figure out our motives within the question. Are we doubting God or are we questioning God with our questions? Are we tempting to limit God? Because sometimes that's what we do. 
when it comes to our doubts and our questions when it comes to the faith. It's a huge, it's a huge temptation when it comes to do this with the supernatural things uh, of God, like the virgin birth and the resurrection and this idea of the Holy Spirit. Um, in the 50s, what was really popular at the time was what's known as liberal theology. Most 99.9% .9 of the time, if you hear me say the word liberal from the pulpit, I'm not talking about politics. Okay, I'm not. I'm talking about liberal theology. What liberal theology does is it takes the Bible and it tries to explain away all the supernatural and tries to make sense of it. It tries to say that you can still have a Christian faith without the virgin birth, without the resurrection, without the Holy Spirit, without really a God. And you just can't do that. Like, it just doesn't work. You know, Paul flat out said if the, if the resurrection didn't happen, then we who believe it above all are to be pitied most. We're to be pitied most, is what he said. All right, but this goes on. Uh, we're going to look at Gabriel's explanation. All right, so now Mary receives a very simple answer. And this, this answer, it's simple. It's simple for her. It's simple for us. The angel answered her, The Holy Spirit will come upon you, and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. Therefore, the child, will be, the child to be born will be called Holy, the Son of God. So here, the answer Mary received is actually a foreshadow of the same answer that you and I get anytime we ask the question, well, how are we going to do this impossible thing that God is calling us to do? How are we going to, you know, how, how are we going to grow as a church in a town of less than a thousand people that's really declining and that really doesn't have much to offer as far as industry and business goes? How are we going to do that? How are we going to do that? How are we, you know, how, how am I going to share the gospel with somebody when I don't feel like I have all the right answers? And not only that, like, you know, sometimes I'm, I'm just not sure what I really believe myself. Well, the same way, here, the Holy Spirit will come upon you and the power of, most, and the, power of the Most High will overshadow you. Same answer. Same answer. Many have said here that what Gabriel's describing is actually like a sexual act between God and Mary, and that's not the case at all. Like when you look at the Greek, it's what, what it's talking about. So like the, the, this idea that we see is a, in the Septuagint, Greek translation of the Old Testament, right? It's this idea of overshadow, right? And so what you see is God's presence in the sanctuary, right? Anytime you, you talk about like the sanctuary and a temple in the Old Testament and you get the idea of God's power overshadowing shadowing it, God's presence overshadowing it, that's the same kind of thing that, that, that we're talking about here. In the New Testament, it's this overshadowing presence, this, you know, what you see in like a, the transfiguration where Jesus is talking to God upon the mountain transfiguration and the apostles are with him and all of a sudden like there's boom, thunder, God's talking to him and telling him, you know, and Peter has, you know, he says, hey, let me build some altars here and God tells him, sit down, shut up, this is my son, listen to him. You know, that same thing, like God's power overshadowing, God's presence overshadowing. That's what we're talking about here. Well, it wasn't a sexual experience. It was definitely a very real thing that she would experience. She would, she would experience, like she would know, first of all, she'd get pregnant. Right? Any of you who've, bear, who've born children, any of you women who've born children, you know, you know when you're pregnant. Right? Like there comes a point and you just know something's off, something's not right. So that happened. Right? But then not only that, like her interaction with God, the presence of the Holy Spirit with her, like this real thing that was taking place, it's very real. It's just like it should be for you and I. Like, I mean, we, we should stop and question ourselves sometime. Like, I, I claim to believe in Jesus. Like, I claim to be a born-again believer, which means that I claim to have the Holy Spirit of God inside of me. How does that, what does that look like lately? Like, what is God leading me to do and how do I know? Does God ever lead you? Like, and, and if so, how do you know? And because the way that we typically do it in America is, oh, well, if it means more money for me, then that means God's leading me there. Oh, if it means a better situation for me, that means God's leading me there. That's not what you get when it comes to this, you know, to, to what it means to biblically follow God's leading. Okay? But this idea of like this life with the Spirit, it's, it's very real. It's not something that we, can, that we should think lightly of. It's something that we should ask ourselves about. We should seek our heart. We should examine our hearts. We should seek God about it. Listen to this, John 3, 6. That which was born of, of the flesh is flesh, and that which was born of the Spirit is spirit. So we are flesh and we're spirit. We are flesh, we have a human spirit, but we also have God's Holy Spirit living inside of us. It's a real thing. We should be able to figure out, we should be able to pinpoint exact things the other day when I was sharing my faith with this kid in the gym, it was the craziest thing because usually when I go to the gym, I prefer to go alone. I put headphones on. I don't talk to anybody. And here's this kid. He's insisted upon, uh, upon talking to me, and he's sharing his heart with me, telling me about all these horrible things that he's going through. And I was like, dude, shut up. I just want to put my headphones on and work out. What do you? And then all of a sudden, God was like, no. You talk to people about sharing their faith. Talk to this kid about Jesus. Okay. 
I'm gonna do, you know, and so I'm sitting here and I go and I talk to this kid about Jesus and it was, it was crazy. He needed it. I needed to do it. And by the end of it, like when I got done with my workout, I was able to pray with this kid. I left. He's in tears. You know, I'm just, I'm just, oh my goodness, God just, you know, that's, we should be able to look at our lives and say, is God leading us to do something? And if so, how do we know? And are we doing it? I could have gone all bad. I, I, I was still, even if he would have said, I don't believe in Jesus, shut up. You're, you're, you know, I mean, that could have gone all sorts of ways. Even if that would have happened, I could still say, well, God led me to do that. And it didn't go well. It made the relationship with this kid get really, you know, get really awkward. You know, but still, could I say that just because it didn't go the way that I wanted it to, that God wasn't leading me to do it? No. God oftentimes leads his people into situations that are going to birth persecution, that are going to birth hardship. We have to be okay with that. That's a way of Jesus literally putting us at the tip of the sword and saying, it's the world or me. It's the world or me. And we have to be okay with that because, I mean, if we read the Bible, we can't tiptoe around it. Like, Jesus wants our hearts. He wants all of us. He doesn't just want some parts. He doesn't, he doesn't just want Sunday mornings. He wants everything. He goes, you have a job because I've given it to you. You can work because I've given you the ability. You have your health because I've allowed you to keep your health. You know? Use it for my glory. Use it for my kingdom. Like, that's the calling. 1 Corinthians 12, 13, For in one spirit we were all baptized into one body. We all have the same Holy Spirit. We have one body of believers, right? And now here's the thing. Is that any other Bible-believing, gospel-preaching church, we're the same spirit, same body. That's why we look at each other and we can call each other brothers and sisters in Christ. Romans eight sixteen: The Spirit Himself bears witness with our spirit that we are children of God. Do you know this about yourself this morning? Do you know that you are a child of God? If you've placed your faith in Jesus, you are a child of God. That's a big deal. That's not a title to be taken lightly. That's something that we should let sink in. And it came at a price. Like, I really loved what, you know, like Pastor Marvin used to call everybody blood-bought, born-again, children of the king. At first, that really drove me nuts. I didn't like it. And then the more he said it, the more he said it, I was like, Yeah. It's like, that's right. Like, there's only one king, king above all kings, name above all names, and I'm his children, and I was bought with the blood of his son. There's only one way. It's him. All right, so after, after delivering, after delivering this, this, the news that God had given uh, to, the, you know, to the angel for Mary, Gabriel offers a sign, and he tells her, he says, Behold, your relative Elizabeth in her old age also has conceived a son, and this is the sixth month with her who is called barren. All right, so up, up until this point in time, you have to think, so your first century Israel, no cell phones, no Facebook, no Twitter, no way for Mary to have known. Like, you know, you get the little cute birth announcements on, or the uh, pregnancy announcements on Facebook, you know, oh, look, it's a picture of an ultrasound, you know, the little booties and the onesie, you know, with no baby yet, and everyone's like, oh, congratulations. That, that didn't happen back then. It didn't happen back then. Right? So, so literally there was no way she, you know, there was no way for there to travel. So now this angel appears and says, not only is this going to happen, but your cousin has been pregnant for six months. And so there's another prophecy being fulfilled, you know, for your cousin, with your cousin who's been barren and who was told she would never have children. Right? And then he goes on and he gives her this encouraging reminder. He says, uh, he says, nothing will be impossible with God. Nothing will be impossible with God. I don't care what you're going through. Nothing will be impossible with God. You can get through the hardest of times because nothing will be impossible with God. You know, one of the, I, I can't stand it. It's one of my pet peeves when people sit there and talk about, uh, oh, God will never bring you to anything that you can't handle. Yes, he will. He does it all the time. If you are sitting there and, and, and if you think for a second that everything on your plate is something that you can do and that you can handle on your own, then God didn't lead you to probably any of it. Okay? That's just normal, general stuff that God pretty much expects you to do. But now when all of a sudden you're told to share your faith with somebody you know is hostile to, or is hostile to Christianity, and that's something God's probably leading you to do. Because for that man to be converted, God has to change his heart. And so now you can't make that person a Christian. Right? And so when you go and you talk to that person about Christ, you need to understand that God has to go before you. You can't do it. Right? Now that's something. Now all of a sudden you've been married for X amount of years and your spouse has been healthy up until this time and all of a sudden there's a cancer diagnosis. I don't know how I'm going to get through this. I've prayed and prayed and prayed and you know it's not going into remission. It's not happening. It's not going to happen the way that I want it to. I don't know how in the world I'm possibly going to live without my spouse. You can do all things through Christ who strengthens you. You can do all things through Christ who strengthens you. And here's the thing, and this is the part that we don't like to talk about, 
in the American church is that even those situations, even those ones, God is using to shape you and to form you to look more like Jesus. Do you, do you get that? Everything hard that goes on in your life, God's using to shape you and to form you to look more like Jesus. Later on, you know, and you're like, well, God would never let this happen. If God loved me, if God loved, do you think God loves you more than he loves his son? But he loves you enough to give his son up for you. For nothing will be impossible with God. And here's the thing is that at this point in time, we know that Mary didn't have rose-colored glasses on, okay? It wasn't as though Mary knew that, uh, that somehow her life was going to get remarkably better. Okay, we look at this and you, you, you figure this out when you look at the text and it says that she was betrothed to a man named Joseph. Okay, betrothed is like a it's, a, it's a first century term that kind of signifies engagement. But here engagement is really loose, right? I mean, engagements, you know, form and break all the time. Nobody, you know, I mean, here we have this thing called annulment. You can get married and with a certain amount of time, you can just go and be like, eh, I changed my mind. I want to annul the marriage. No big deal, you know. No harm done. Uh, we'll just call it a day. You know, sorry, thought it would work out. It didn't, didn't really like you as much as I thought I would. That wasn't the case here. That wasn't the case here. Betrothed, it was, it was more binding than a, modern engage, than a modern engagement. It was basically a form of marriage. It was like, uh, it, it was just as binding as marriage because you had to end up getting a divorce in order to break a betrothment. But you had to go a certain amount of time where you did not live together. You did not sleep together. So a woman was expected to keep her virginity. Okay, now if a woman was unfaithful during a betrothment, the man was, not only did he have the option to divorce, he was expected to. It was a cultural expectation for that man to divorce his wife because any upright man who respected himself in any way would divorce that woman who cheated on him during their betrothment. And now chances are, if she was caught in adultery during their betrothment, she'd be taken out and stoned outside of the city. Do you think for a second that Mary, you know, the, here's the thing, the angel could have said, oh yeah, don't worry, it's going to be, it's going to be your, it's going to be your and Joseph's first kid, that's going to be the Messiah. She, he, he, no, no, he said, God is going to miraculously give you a baby, and it's going to change everything, but it's going to be the Messiah. It's going to be the Savior of the world. She knew that it was going to change everything. She knew. She knew that she was going to have to live the rest of her life basically being called a whore by her community. Okay? That Jesus was literally going to be referred to and seen as a bastard child. Okay? Let that sink in. And I'm using these terms in their proper context. Right? I'm not cussing from the pulpit. I'm telling you exactly what it's going to be. Okay? When, when she said, you know, when she, she knew in, first, in a town called Nazareth, if she was going to be pregnant before their marriage was actually finished, that the entire community, her reputation was shot for life. Okay? It's, not, it's, not like, it's not like somebody who goes out and cheats on their husband or a man who goes out and cheats on his wife and you know, they're just like, oh, you shouldn't do that. You know? And a divorce is as common as water here. You know, it's not that way back then. Okay, back then, the man was expected to basically lead the stoning in his, in, in his, in his uh, fiancée who, who just cheated on him. Like she knew. And here's the thing. She didn't know how, at this point in time how Joseph was going to react. She didn't know. She knew that her life was going to be turned upside down. She probably wouldn't be able to find work. She probably wouldn't be able to have a healthy marriage after that. You know. She knew. And then not only that... She knew that she, or she didn't know, but what ended up happening when you look at the life of Mary and you consider the life of Jesus, you know, she, what ended up happening was that she watched the Son of God come into the world, live this life, and, and be the leader of one of the most miraculous, world-changing ministries that the world has ever known. The world has ever known. He, did, he didn't sin. There was nobody more morally upright than Jesus. There was nobody more spiritually sound than Jesus. There was nobody who, there, there, there's nobody who deserve, you know, who, who didn't deserve anything bad to happen to him other than Jesus. And yet this man was later on falsely accused, beaten half to death, nailed to a cross, and she got a front row seat to the entire thing. So she knew her life was going to be turned upside down. And listen, listen, to, listen to her response. <laughs> listen to her response. Mary said, Behold, I am, a, I am the servant of the Lord. Let it be to me according to your word. And then the angel departed. She didn't question him. 
she didn't say, well, what am I going to do when everybody starts calling me these horrible names that, that, that are going to come when all of a sudden I'm praying? What am I going to do when they start trying to drag me outside of the city to kill me? What am I going to do? She said, behold, I'm a servant of the Lord. Let it be to me as you've said. Have you ever said to God, and can you say now, that I am a servant of the Lord, may it be to me as you've said, regardless of what it might look like? Have you ever been there? Will you be there now? Because that's the type of heart, like that's the kind of servant's heart that God wants from us. He's not going to call everybody to martyrdom. He's not going to call everybody to sacrifice everything. But he wants that kind of heart in every one of his people. I personally believe that martyrdom is something that, uh, I, I, th I think that in God's eyes, it's something that's, that's very, uh, it's a gift more than anything. Like true martyrdom. There are people who go out and they like try to create their own situation. Anyway, that's a whole other thing. But not everybody's called to that. But he wants you to be willing to follow God regardless of what it might cost you. This is exactly how Jesus taught us to pray, isn't it? In the Lord's Prayer, listen, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Father, let your will be done right here, just as it is in heaven. Right? When Jesus was going to the cross himself, not my will, God, but yours be done. Not my will, but yours. When's the last time we've said that to God and actually meant it? If you can look to God with joy in your heart and say, I am the Lord's servant, may it be done to me as you've said, you are blessed by God. You are blessed by God. You know, sometimes we, we walk around and we're like, oh, well, I mean, I guess, you know, I, I'll, I'll do it if that's what God wants. You know, I guess I'll do it if that, you know, you know, I guess if that's what God calls me to, I guess I'll just deal with it. You know, that, that, that can be our attitude sometimes. But to look at it joyfully, I mean with joy, and I'm not talking about like cheesy, Ned Flanders, superficial Christianity joy. I'm talking about like deep in the heart, I know this is going to crush me, but God, I love you and your will type of joy. Like the one with tears streaming down your face, yet you're still smiling somehow. Kind of joy. Like after a child being born, kind of joy. That's the, that's the joy. So here, just a few closing reflections, right? So uh, this story of the Bible is ours because of the humble heart that the Virgin Mary had. She wasn't sinless. We don't pray to Mary. Right? She doesn't dispense grace to us. But she is an example for us to follow when it comes to how we should follow Jesus. All right? She was humble in heart. She was poor in spirit. She was not self-sufficient. She did not rely on herself. She relied fully upon God. Now, I'm not saying that you don't be self-sufficient in the way that you, you know, I'm not telling you go out and don't work and don't pay your bills and don't take care of your responsibilities. That's not it. I'm talking about the posture of a Christian's heart should be that, God, if you left me now, I couldn't do anything and I wouldn't want to do anything. That's what I mean by, by not being self-sufficient. You know, if you can look at your life and say, oh, I think I'd be just fine without God. That's self-sufficiency. Repent of it. That's sin. And we can all get there. We can all get there. She was open to the grace of God. Right? Open enough to say, you know, though it's going to cost me much, I'm a servant of the Lord. Let it be to me as you've said. All right. Mary's reflective and meditative nature made her open to God's word and work in her life. Her willingness to just sit and let God's word sink in, to ponder what God has said. I mean, if you read through the teachings of Jesus, if you read through the New Testament, there is no possible way that you can come up with the idea that what Christianity should look like from a biblical perspective is what we have in the American church and in the West. If you let the truth of the Bible sink in, there's no way you can look at the American church and say, we're on it, we're on it, we're doing well. It is not true. I think we need to meditate and ponder God's word. Mary believed in God's power, not her own. Right? She, may have wondered it, how, she may have wondered how it was going to work. Right? She was a virgin. How in the world am I going to have a kid as a virgin? Fair question. Fair question. That's not a doubt. She got her answer and she went and did it. Right? She went and did it. You know, she was truly submitted to God. She said, this is going to cost everything, but I am the Lord's servant. May it be to me as you have said. That's why she was called blessed. Do you understand that if Christ is in us, 
which, you know, Galatians 2.20 says that Christ is in us. We have the Holy Spirit in us. Uh, if, so if Christ is in us and if we are children of God, then Mary's heart is our model for discipleship. If you were a born-again believer, Mary's heart and her posture towards God is your model for discipleship and my model for discipleship. So that means that we need to seek to have a, a humble heart. We need to cultivate within ourselves a humble heart. We need to look at it and say, you know, God, how can I be more humble before you? How can I be more humble before you, God? Right, it's a poverty of spirit that, that longs for God's gracious intrusion in your life. You ever sit around and, and wait and want God's gracious intrusion into your life? I mean, I don't, I'm not sure, I, I, I'm not sure how I would handle it. Uh, uh, you know, I... Uh, I don't know. I just remember, like when I when I first came came to believe in Christ, like I remember I naturally tried to go back to living the way that I was, and I couldn't because of something that God had done in me. But I think that that's really the I don't I don't know. But I want I want that to happen. Like I I want God to intrude into my life and and give me something to do. Now here's the thing: we must have believing hearts. Do you believe that the pursuit of Christ is worth more than anything this world can offer you? Do you? I mean, it's, it, what the Bible says is that the pursuit of Christ is worth more than anything this world has to offer. You know, so do you believe it? We need to seek to have believing hearts. We have to have submissive hearts. You know, my, my hope is that for each and every last one of us that we would be able to, to say, you know, with joy, though it might cost me everything, I'm the Lord's servant. May it be to me as you've said. Let's pray.